Welcome to Zenfeed's Feed on the Street podcast series, consisting of educational conversations with influencers, industry leaders, and channel executives across the world. In this series, we will discuss evolving trends and real-life customer challenges with partner relationship management and automation. Listen right here to those road warriors with both feet on the street, discussing the dynamics of all aspects of partner ecosystems. Morning, everybody. Um, I'm super excited to welcome Jason Beal, Vice President of Worldwide Partner Ecosystems of Barracuda. Uh, Jason, welcome to our podcast. Um, I know we've been talking for a while. You have a lot to share. And I'm super excited about the next uh, you know, several minutes that we're going to talk about you know, where the partner ecosystem is going, a little bit about your journey, how, how you think the world is shaping up. There's a lot happening today. So welcome. Thank you. I appreciate the uh, invitation to join. I'm looking forward to it. Awesome. So um, I know we chatted a bit and you have an amazing background in multiple tech companies, in distribution. You've traveled around the world. You're lo- you, today you're running a very large, complex ecosystem in a very successful company. So instead of uh, me trying to butcher your background, what I thought I would do is have you kind of start at the beginning, how you got into tech, you know, what got you excited, um, you know, what you've seen over the years and and what brought you to Barracuda today? Yeah, so I'll I'll go all the way back even to to the end of high school. I just I knew that I wanted to do international business. I was uh, I I worked. I've had a paper route uh, since I was 10 years old had multiple jobs in my teenage years and even did some internships there and was really fascinated by global business. And so I went into uh, the University of California at Davis with an international relations major and, um, you know, studied a lot academically there and then had a job within the action sports industry that actually helped me to get real hands on with international business, um, doing licensing and distribution and manufacturing our goods all around the world. And then I just happened to get a phone call one day from, uh, from a recruiter and, uh, they were trying to fill a kind of a product management job within a, uh, domestic value added distributor. So the company was called optical laser and kind of their niche within their portfolio was content management and enterprise storage solutions. Again, a domestic distributor. And uh, I jumped at the opportunity, got into the IT industry, was incredibly fascinated. I spent about five years there, and, you know, worked my way up in various roles and learned an awful lot about distribution, about the channel, about the industry. And then uh, went back to school and earned an executive MBA from Chapman University, there too with a focus on international. And, you know, after I completed that, I, I said, I'm ready to go to work for a much larger company, a Fortune 100 company. And I think the natural company for me to move to was uh, Ingram Micro. You know, Ingram at that time, I believe, was publicly listed about Fortune 60, probably doing 20-ish billion dollars. And so I said, that's a great opportunity for me to go work, learn how to work inside of a larger corporation, but also have opportunities uh, to potentially move overseas. So I made the transition to Ingram and got in a really good part of Ingram which was the beginnings of this move from break fix services to managed services. We helped build out a portfolio of services for partners called Seismic. And then that eventually became Ingram Micro Cloud. So, you know, my colleagues and I were doing a lot of evangelization to the partner community around cloud computing, around remotely delivered services, around as a service. And um, then I started to raise my hand and say, yeah, you know, we'd, we'd love to go over to Europe. My wife, is French. Uh, my children already spoke both French and English, and Ingram was supportive and moved my family and I over to, to Belgium, where their uh, European headquarters was at the time, and got into a great role with, uh, with their value business and also evangelizing cloud computing, and stayed with Ingram about four years in Europe, and then made the transition to Palo Alto Networks, uh, where I uh, run distribution and commercial channels. And then Palo Alto Networks moved the family and I back to the United States and took different uh, different roles there. Uh, And then I'm at uh, Barracuda now. Um, Incredible company, uh, channel centric from day one, uh, cybersecurity focused. And so I'm running global channels. So that's a 
that's a long answer, but a little bit about both my academic and my professional background. That is fantastic. I also saw you in your background that you're teaching actually at Chapman as an adjunct professor. I so am. what got you? I think that's something that I wanted to do, you know, at, at the right time in my um, career. And it's something that I hope to do more when I, you know, quote unquote, retire from, you know, a, a more of a full time um, corporate executive job. So I said, you know, it's good to get some of that experience, start to build out the, the CV. And um, so, yeah, I went, I went to my uh, alumni and I said, hey, you know, are there any opportunities? And I am teaching in the program that I had graduated from their executive MBA. And I teach an operations, supply chain, and technology management course. So right in my wheelhouse, it's great. It's one semester a year in the fall semester. And uh, it's um, I love it. It's uh, There's a lot of, let's say, fulfillment and instant gratification when you see the students really embracing and learning the material. So, yeah, that's something that I do, again, one one semester a year. That's fantastic. So, so I guess we'll get a few lessons today. Uh, during our discussion also. So, so, so let's step back a little bit. Uh, maybe, you know, a decade ago uh, when you were in distribution, maybe we'll start sort of, you know, in the middle of, of, of the channel, you know, between mm -hmm. a brand and, and a partner. Uh, where do you think at a macro level with all of these forces at play, uh, distribution is going at a, at a high level? Uh, I it's interesting because in, in our industry, there have been different cycles, different periods in the last two decades, right? Where various technology or industry trends have led many to predict the death, demise, and disintermediation of distribution. First, it was e-commerce or, or, or to move from hardware to software, software licensing to cloud, or resell to managed services, resale to uh, online, e-tail, cloud computing, etc. And in each case, distribution has not just survived, but thrived some in those changes. Um, in fact, today, I say today is a golden age for aggregation. I think there are more two-tier aggregators more two-tier aggregation business models than ever before, and they're thriving. There certainly is, you know, classic wholesale resale distribution from some of the classic or legacy distributors, but there are also many other types of aggregators. There's always a need in, in various industries economically for aggregation, and there is always a need for services development. And that's what the distributors and some of these other two-tier aggregators are are providing they're providing aggregation and they're providing a wealth of different channel development or channel services so uh, i see distribution as it, it's a, it's a golden age the classic distributors have evolved there's a new set of cloud distributors and then there's kind of a new cadre of various um, two-tier aggregators that are providing a lot of uh, services in the channel there, there have been some recent uh, announcement and acquisitions also from a roll-up perspective, which is pretty obvious because distribution is a scale business and as, as supply chain gets more and more efficient, there will be obvious scale-up. Yeah. But how do you see the intersection of distribution and marketplaces? Because it seems like the marketplaces are becoming virtual distributors and you plug in third-party logistics behind these three or four major marketplaces, suddenly they can now distribute hardware and not just share, you know, software keys. How does that, you think, get played out? Because yeah. when it comes to this whole notion of co-sell, co-market, uh, distribution hasn't been that successful. I mean, yes, they have bundled, you know, going after the partner, uh, yeah. offering them. But actually, when it comes to co-market through and co-sell through the partner network, which the marketplaces seem to be a lot more effective, how does that play out in the end, you think? Yeah, I think, you know, both these, the, the new marketplaces, right, as you said, are, are broadening and evolving, you know, what they're doing, but distribution is doing the same going the other way. I'll also take a step back and say, I, I do recall a very similar, you know, um, conversations, conversation. right, yeah. where, when the rise of e-commerce happened and everybody thought, hey, now that everybody can just go online and buy from some of these new online retailers or resellers and hey what are the distributors going to do well what did they do they the distributors simply became the backbone of many of those e-commerce that they 
provided the warehousing, third-party logistics services delivered down to the end users, provided a lot of data, a lot of marketing. So they became a backbone there. I think that distribution has evolved, right? That they have their own marketplace strategy, which if you look at some of the statistics, and in fact, Barracuda ran a report recently around, you know, the partners leveraging distribution and hyperscaler marketplaces, the MSPs are relying on those marketplaces more than ever. Now, it's whether it's uh, Ingram Micro and their, uh, what was formerly called Ingram uh, Cloud, Aero with Aerosphere, uh, T Cynix with, uh, you know, Stream One slash Stellar, they are providing more and more opportunities for partners to run their business, automate their business, provision software, bill end users, improve their productivity, reduce costs to serve. So yeah, there you also have a rise of these new distributors. Look at a PAX 8. PAX 8 is a distributor. They have a focus more on software and managed services, but you know they'll help with partner recruitment for vendors, they help with partner onboarding, partner training, partner credit management, all of those classic services as well. So they, the classic distributors have evolved. There's a, a brand new set of these cloud focused distributors. And then yeah, the, mic, the hyperscalers are offering transactional services, hardware or software, but probably aren't yet offering as much of the, you know, channel management as the distributors do. So from a, you know, from a value chain perspective, partner ecosystem perspective, um, you know, as you have said, it has continuously evolved. When you think about, you know, a couple of decades ago, uh, as these new sectors would form or sub segments like solid state hard drive, mm -hmm. you know, like micro segments would form, new distributors would come into play, right? Mm -hmm. Because they'll figure out put some money together, put some relationships together, kind of become the bank and a warehouse that you're, that you kind of talked about, right? And then when you look at these kind of broadliners, Ingram, Tech Data, uh, Arrows of the world, they were not that global, right? They, they were very, very US centric and they tried to, do, tried to acquire. Mm -hmm. But now most of those broadliners are pretty broad abroad also mm -hmm. in outside the US, right? And, and when we sold, especially hardware, couple of decades ago, or maybe even a decade ago, we will have multi-tier channels, right? We'll have um, large DISTs selling it to a bunch of regional DISTs, then they're selling it to partners and providing a support infrastructure. Do you see it is becoming harder for distribution to start, like new people to start distribution business because these broadliners are essentially going to scale up and go and become more of a platform play across the globe, like the way marketplaces are becoming? That's a great question. And certainly the volume of these like specialized niche VADs, both uh, niche as far as their new technology category and their geographic coverage, certainly the volume of those does seem to have been, you know, notably reduced. You're seeing less and less startups of these new VADs. And it's interesting in the last, call it a half a dozen years, there have been some that you know have started as again these kind of these cloud focused, software focused, as a service focused, strong platform, strong marketing capabilities, and it's interesting how quick that they were acquired. You know, it used to take a VAD maybe a good ten years to get a build up to get to a certain scale, expertise, resource uh, acquisition of vendor contracts before that there's you know enough value there for them to sell some of those new ones have been acquired really quick because of the software intellectual property the marketplace intellectual property but i definitely agree with you that the, the, the just the number right the volume of new distributor startups both by geography and category has has slowed um, in the last uh, handful of years is it because of the large distributors um, that you mentioned and uh, the exclusive networks of the world that are already now in every theater is it because of their geo coverage? I'd say part of it is geo coverage, but part of it is that these lines between a volume or a broadliner distributor and a quote unquote value or specialized distributor have definitely blurred. All of those big distributors that you mentioned 
Arrow, TDS, Ingram, Exclusive Networks, Infinigate, all of them have both. All of them have a real high volume, high velocity, transactional, low margin business and capability and infrastructure. And they have all of their new specialized business units with dedicated resources, pre-sales, post-sales. So they can do both. Whereas 10 years ago, again, you had much more of a separation between volume and value. So so let, let, let's kind of talk about the last two words because distribution, you know, traditionally, uh, traditionally, not always, focus on the long tail, right? From, from a volume perspective. Uh, and, and then companies, brand like yours, managed top tier partners directly, even though they've been fulfilled through this deal, but the relationship has been managed predominantly by the brand, right? With partner mm-hmm. account managers, um, channel sales, uh, yeah. the overall infrastructure. And with the rate of change um, that's kind of happening, do you see a lot of those, um, uh, because the transaction velocities are also changing, especially through these marketplaces, right? Do you see some of those tails are also going to get rolled up? The brands are going to manage directly or you kind of see in hardware, it plays out differently than software. You know, when you look at just the life cycle of a company, you know, of a startup, let's say they start up in, uh, in Israel or the Middle East, they start up in Singapore or other parts of APAC, they start up in Silicon Valley or other parts. And, you know, they're first just trying to get their technology into the hands of a subset of small or a subset of customers and do some proof of concepts. And then uh, they get a little bit more funding. They start to build out their sales team. They grow a little bit. They then start to build out a small partner network, typically domestically in the country that they started. And then at some point they have ambition to go international. All of the, the those those technology vendors, OEMs, ISVs, they have decisions to make around what they do with their their opex, right? the next dollar that they spend, the next headcount that they hire. And typically, right, typically in our industry, the more that you can invest in in R&D, right, your engineers, your coders building out incredible technology, the more that you can invest in some of your direct sales, your touch to the end customer, your, your hunters, your business development, your account manager, and the more than that you can put into your marketing capabilities, com- corporate branding, digital marketing, et cetera, is really where you're going to typically have success in growth. Now, I said all of that, and I didn't mention a lot of the other things that's necessary for you to scale out a business and provide coverage, which is typically the channel piece. If you want to land in a country, expand in different theaters, right? hit a certain velocity of sales across enterprise, mid-market or SMB, it's typically where the channel comes in. So you can say, I want to go do it myself. I'm going to hire a bunch of people to do all those sorts of things and be at every trade show and in every pub and uh, knock on every partner door myself and have an infrastructure to collect credit from all of these partners. Or you can outsource that. It's, you know, it's, it's classic going, going back to some of the things that, 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 that I teach every company. What's your core competence? What's your competitive advantage? Invest in that. And if it's not, partner or outsource. And that's what channel is. Channel partners of all shapes and sizes or the distributors. So I still fundamentally maintain that a companies, tech companies, again, regardless of ha- hardware or software, invest in their own core competencies and competitive advantages, and then outsource a lot of that go to market through the channel. And so the channel can still provide an incredible amount of value, help those companies grow, reduce cost to sell, reduce cost to serve by delivering on that value proposition of, you know, your partner ecosystem. That's brilliant. So, so let, let's take those last two points. Uh, one is, you know, focusing on core competencies. And second one is partnering up, right, to accelerate growth. Uh, So when you think about the domain you're in, it is possibly the most exciting domain. I mean, it's exciting and scary at at both, you know, (laughs) equally at the same time. I mean, unfortunately, you know, what happened week or 10 days ago with with the world shutting down and, and despite best effort from major companies, you know, people make mistakes and things happen. Mm -hmm. Uh, But keeping that specific point aside, 
coming back to a kind of a rate of change. You know, it, it is ex exponentially speeding yeah. up. So how do you, like, how are you from a Barracuda perspective when you think about next kind of three years uh, horizon and you think about this amazing opportunity, there are threats from AI, but there are also opportunities from AI. How do you get your partners ready to this sort of the new world where they have to learn faster, mm -hmm. deploy faster, yeah. support faster, and incidents like like what happened a couple of weeks ago, unfortunately, will happen again because we live in such a complex world. Mm -hmm. So when you when you kind of think it through, how, what is in your mind? What are you telling your partners that they should be thinking about, and what are you thinking about? Yeah. So I'll apologize in advance, but this will be a long answer. Okay. So. Yeah. I'll start with an anecdote. Recently, you know, downstairs in, in my um, outdoor patio, my mother-in-law is in town. She's staying with us for most of the summer. She lives uh, just outside of Paris, and she did not want to be in Paris during the Olympics. So she's coming over. She's spending time with us, and we had the opportunity when I was working from home one day to have lunch on the patio table outside. And she's asking a little bit about, you know, what I do and, and Barracuda. And then she started to ask about AI. And I gave her an interesting look back. I said, you know, in, in our industry, we talk about these hype cycles, right? There's always this new technology category that comes out, potential new, new products. They get hyped up a lot. There's a period of time. Some end up making it manifesting that hype and then others don't and i gave her some examples i said remember you know a decade ago we were all going to have the the smart sun you know the smart glasses and that was going to be the next thing and if google had theirs and i think facebook had theirs and there was a big hype around these these smart glasses and i said something like that it never really came to fruition it's trying again in its second you know time but and then i said and then i look at cloud computing Again, a little over a dozen years ago, 15 years ago, we started to really get hyped up around cloud computing. So we did everything, OEMs, ISVs, distributors, our, to get our partners ready to take advantage of the cloud. And, you know, our hype is always out ahead of it, but cloud caught up. It took about half a decade, but then all of a sudden it manifested. It's a part of our lives, SaaS and IaaS and PaaS, and we're all using it and everybody's using it right on down to the consumers. Yeah, but it always, it always takes a while. And what I explained to uh, my mother-in-law, Christine, I said, with AI, I've never seen anything like it. I've never seen anything that's had as short of a cycle from when the hype, we started talking about it in our industry and what it could do and what it will be to how quickly it's actualized, how quickly in our day-to-day -day lives, in our day-to-day -day businesses, in our industry, and in the challenges facing all of us, vendors, distributors, partners, and the end customers, it's already here. But we don't have a half a decade to help the partners to get ready for the both the risks and the opportunities with AI. We just simply don't. It's here. Like Microsoft with Copilot, it's amazing right out of the gate what some of those capabilities are and how I, I think they're doing a service to the industry at large, to the partner ecosystem at large, saying, hey, lean in, learn as quickly as you possibly can around about Copilot. Provide services and education for your end customers on how to take advantages of some of those capabilities. At Barracuda, we've built in AI to most of our products and our services like XDR. And we're doing a ton of partner enablement to say, understand those and not just understand it for their own business and how it's aiding with security efficacy or user productivity, but understand it in a way that you can articulate that to your end customers and prospects. Why can Copilot help their life? Why can all the AI that's built into Barracuda cybersecurity platform help? And also, again, why AI, the bad actors, are also going to use it more and more and more. We have a product for security awareness training 
that managed service providers or partners can go out and do training. We are like leaning into that product with our partners saying, now more than ever, the bad guys are going to use AI to try to trick your employees. So don't just do a once a quarter training. Maybe it's a once a month training. Maybe that training is refreshed every single month with some of the latest things that are happening in the industry. So long answer there, but absolutely the the industry, we have a duty to help our partners to encourage their, you know, that they are moving fast, understanding quickly, and then getting quickly out to their end customers. Because in this case, we just don't have a half a decade to kind of catch up, you know, to, to help them to catch up with the hype cycle. It's already happening. So, so from a training perspective, uh, I hear, you know, you're putting in a lot of effort. Uh, Jason, uh, talk, talk to us a little bit about what do you see at a kind of a global level? Um, because you travel a lot and you have partners, you, you know, even though today the market is a little bit down, but macro wise, you know, we're looking good. Like it, everybody's saying over the next 18 to 24 months, yeah, there may be blips in it here and there, but in general, right? But there are a couple of two or three major drivers. Well, Western world has a lot of debt and there's not a lot of people out there to buy those debt. As a result of that, interest rates and et cetera kind of stay high, right? And then investments that the governments are making into educational infrastructure are not that great. So in general, with the rate of change of technology that's happening, there is a forecast, even though, you know, we have a decent amount of people coming into workforce, but they're not going to be AI ready or tech ready. So how do you address that? Because that will possibly, you know, partners are going to face that. Companies like yours are dealing with that. So when it when it comes to these, even though we will hear headline unemployment is going to 4.3 percent or five, whatever the number is, but the broader issue is where the people are needed. There, the skills are not there. Mm-hmm. So how how are you thinking of addressing that? How are you talking to partners about sort of specific tech shortages in the areas of AI? I think for the partners, there's the opportunity for them to leverage automation to increase their productivity, right? So that they can, the, the, the proverbial, do more with less people. Certainly that's applicable. I mean, that's really top of mind for partners I speak with domestically and internationally, leveraging AI, leveraging automation, APIs, integrations, automated workflows uh, in order to enhance partner productivity so that they can do more with the same or less amount of people. At Barracuda, for example, we just introduced our new AI assistant, which is built into our uh, partner portal. We believe it's the first in the industry that has an AI assistant in the partner portal just to save partners time on doing a lot of their workflow and their engagement with us uh, within the partner portal. So partner and their productivity is key. The other side of that is going even harder after the managed services model, uh, MSP and MSSP. The end customers, you know, are going to face the challenges that, that you have discussed. Harder to find people with those specialized technology or cybersecurity and AI skill sets, harder to retain them. We're seeing right now the end user recognition that they need a 24 by seven SOC capability. They need a SOC to have eyes and ears protecting them at all times. Budgets are getting freed up for that, right? That's why the XDR and SOC as a service businesses are doing so well right now. However, the end customers are just not, it's just not possible for them, for all of them to say, I'm gonna go find a minimum of eight NOC and SOC tech have my own red team, blue team, purple team, staff this thing with infrastructure, software, process, people to do 24 by seven. So it's not possible. So they're gonna lean more and more on the partner channel to do that. So I think if, if we are working with our partners, it's one, how do you improve your internal productivity through the use of AI and automation? And then two, how do you then support, build your managed services or your managed security services business to help more and more end customers who are not going to be able to do it themselves. Which is fascinating. We kind of started our discussion about aggregation 
And I think what you're saying is that this rate of change will drive aggregation around distribution, around managed service providers, because of rate of change and the skills and the talents and the capital you need. And we're seeing that at the platform level, right? Yep. When you look at these four or five players with LLMs and access to chips, others can get chips, can build data centers. Mm -hmm. So so aggregation is very much uh, a theme that possibly will accelerate. So now coming back to uh, Jason, a little bit about you. Again, I would love to know um, in your journey, if you have to share some of your thoughts about leadership, uh, you've done some amazing things. You're in the middle of an industry that you know, protects us, uh, drives growth, uh, takes care of transactions and people and healthcare and everything, right, by securing them. So how do you like balance your life when you, when you think about having kids and taking care of mother-in-laws and it you know, looks, looks like a pretty long list. So, okay. so if you have to kind of summarize in a few points okay. and maybe we'll end with that, What's in the day of Jason Beal or a week in Jason Beal look like? Yeah. Yeah. So I, the, the word you mentioned is balance. And I've always adapted it where I add the E for my last name. I call it Beelance. If I've got to live my life in Beelance, and that's typically family first, right? I'm, I'm lucky to have been married for 22 years. I've had four children and uh, put a lot of emphasis on, on the family yeah. quality time, right? That's what matters. You, you, Unfortunately, I have worked for a handful of different uh, folks in my career who have gone maybe over rotated on the career at the expense of family or marriage. And I saw that early. I saw that throughout my career. And I definitely did not want to make the same or, or have that to be my faith as well. Second is, you know, I'm a big believer, healthy body, healthy mind. And particularly as much as we work and as much as we travel, you need that kind of out, that physical outlet to maintain your health and your mental stimulation. So I've done uh, triathlon for 25 years. I'm a part of cycling club. I enjoy surfing and mountain biking and with my 17 year old son. And you know, we do golfing once a month with a, a set of friends and, and folks in the industry. Um, you know, my wife also, we do a lot of that outdoor activity together. We get the kids to the beach and on the bikes and then the hikes. So that, uh, you know, healthy body, healthy mind, stay, stay physically active. And that helps with, with, with stamina and then the kind of managing the stress of our careers. And then, you know, within the uh, work environment, it's, 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 you know, we're not alone. Right, we we don't work individually. We work as as uh, teams, right? Having empathy for coworkers, teammates. Having empathy for partners. Like seeing the world through their eyes. Learning how you can have success together has always um, has always driven me. So when you talk about leadership, I love helping others be successful, developing in their careers. Seeing that professional development, I think that's why I like teaching as well. But that's a lot of part of, of empathy and leading by example and helping others to, to, to be their best. So those are some of my philosophies, right? Family, it's, it's health and it's how do we, how do we create things together? Recently I, I posted on LinkedIn an adaptation of a popular phrase. I said, great minds think align, right? Because the more that we can be aligned again with in, in our personal and professional lives, I think that's where you're going to get, this kind of a sense of fulfillment, a sense of satisfaction, and the types of results that you're that you're looking for, and meeting goals in our professional and personal lives. Awesome. One last question with two parts. Thinking forward, next three years, uh, what do you think you're going to be cautious about, or advise someone to be cautious about, okay. and what are you super excited about? Mm -hmm. I think you know. I say caution is really more around. We don't. You know. You want a partner ecosystem that has not only the sufficient capacity, but a sufficient diversity of partners, right? You have end customers that every day are making different choices, have different needs and preferences for how they want to procure and consume and pay for and manage technologies. And so there's this concept that we talk a lot about on partner hybridity and partner agility, having a set of partners that uh, can meet these various needs and preferences of the end customer. So, yeah, you want the, the proper kind of quantity of partners, but you also want the makeup 
and you don't want to over rotate on this set of partners or that set or this set um, because that might not be, you know, in a year or two wherein customers are choosing to procure uh, their technology. So we're trying to be quite balanced in that, follow the trends, but having quite a diverse uh, set of, of partners. Excited. I mean, we'll go back to, to AI. I mean, I, again, I've never seen anything like this in my life where uh, the hype of a technology of what it could do and what it might look like is manifesting so incredibly quickly and is used every day. I mean, when chat GPT came out, what is like less than two years ago when it really became in the popular and the zeitgeist and kind of the December, 2022 timeframe, my kids were using it immediately. The next semester, I immediately used it in teaching. Almost on a daily basis, I was using it in, in work. Awesome. So let's do a, um, you know, recap in six months and see uh, where we are with AI and, and maybe some of your travels. And uh, thank you again, Jason, for spending the time with us. 